Howdy, my friends. My name is Gunnar Clovis. I am the SO for this year's Austin Global Game Jam 2023. Thank you so much for joining us. I know this has been a rather tumultuous last few weeks with the winter storm here in Austin. All the trees around my place are completely falling down, but we're so glad you could make it. Thank you everyone for attending this year, despite all of the issues with power outages and internet outages and everything going on. Uh, game development is often a very difficult <laughs> field with a lot of last minute troubles, and this has certainly been a microcosm of that, which has been very exciting. So if you haven't already, please make sure to sign up on the Global Game Jam uh, website for the Austin 2023 Jam site. That will be linked down in the description below. And sign up for the Discord if you haven't already. But uh, when this video goes up, it should be right when the Jam starts or shortly after. And so hopefully you should have done that already, but it's no trouble at all if you join the Jam midway through. Any amount of time is perfectly fine to just come in, make games, or just hang out with everybody that's doing so. Thank you all of our sponsors for the Global Game Jam um, across the world, uh, especially Unity, Game Maker, and Coherence, who've had a great presence here for our Austin site, as well as House of How Games for sponsoring our specific Austin Global Game Jam site. Our sponsors have generously provided a lot of great prizes this year. We could, of course, put that all in, put it all in like one giant pot for one or two teams to try and scrape victory towards, but. We are not trying to foster competition necessarily, but cooperative community um, involvement, different um, people coming together to make games together and encourage that spirit of community, uh, especially in these kind of times with the storm here in Austin. So we have one one year long Unity Pro subscription license uh, to give out to one of our top winners, as well as three three month Unity Pro licenses as well as um, a lot of cash prizes. We have seven jam categories this year for best art and animation, most fun, most innovative, best at keeping Austin weird, best music and sound, best UI, and our community choice winner. First place winners will receive $150 payable either as a Steam gift card, a PayPal, or as a charitable donation. And both second and third place winners for every category will also receive $50. That, of course, will have to be distributed as you see fit if you work on a team. Uh, but yeah, we just wanted to reward everybody and trying to encourage everybody to make games together. And yeah, we really are super excited for so many people to be involved this year. Uh, Austin has had a really proud history of having the biggest global game jam in Texas for uh, quite, a, quite a few years now. And you're a great part of that. We really appreciate you. I also want to specially shout out KK Vassal uh, for really stepping up to host an in-person mixer at the Brutorium on Dillard Circle, as well as the EGADS team from UT Austin. EGADS has been an incredible supporter for the Austin Global Game Jam, but a really core part of our crew and team in managing our community. We really, really appreciate your hard work. It's just amazing, amazing folks. Now, I've been making games for pretty much my entire life, it's been my entire career, and I've been a huge fan of game jams for a long, long time. I used to make a game a week, I've run many, many game jams over the years, and so yeah, so I want to impart a little bit of my wisdom, uh, as it were, uh, for how you could maybe improve your games for this game jam, especially if you've never made a game before and you're just trying this as a new thing for the first time, which is awesome, it's a super, super great uh, hobby and practice. Game development is very interdisciplinary, it's very cooperative, it's a very fun way to come together with friends or family, uh, make something that you can share around to people, or if you want to work in this field, game jams are one of, if not the best way to get the skills and experience needed to maybe get your foot in the door with the games industry. All that said, one of my favorite game jam tips is the 444 rule. Uh, this was popularized by Rami Ishmael from Vlambeer, who's awesome. The 444 rule is essentially breaking up a 48 hour game jam, like our global game jam, into four hours and 44 hours, with the first four hours focusing on only making the core gameplay. Meaning that you should really come together rather quickly with whatever your game is about. If it's a platformer, just implement the platforming. Maybe you have a teleport mechanic or a grapple hook mechanic or whatever thing makes your game unique, um, something something special about it, really just work on that uh, in the first few hours and then 
the majority of the gem, the overwhelming majority, you shouldn't spend on trying to add new mechanics, new ideas to your, to your game. Really just focus on polish. That time restriction might sound really difficult or limiting, especially if you're new to game development entirely. But the idea of keeping your scope down, your mechanics, very simple and something you could accomplish in only a few hours and then putting the majority of time into polish, that's a really salient point for all types of game development, but especially for game gems. Working on new ideas, new mechanics, and content throughout the entirety of the jam is doable, but it often results in buggy games, unfinished games, unpolished games, and yeah, it's far better to have something that exists and is playable, even if it's not the biggest game ever, than to work on something that you're like, oh, this could be the coolest thing, but you don't actually get it done. And that's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a normal story for basically anyone who tries game jams or game development. And keeping that scope down, what we call our MVP or minimum viable product, as tiny as possible, that's super, super valuable in this context. So really cut down scope, both in the planning phase and in your execution, always keep it very, very small. And don't fall into the trap thinking that you have to make this big, grand game. You don't. You Not only do you not have to, it's not always the best, it's usually not the best thing. And it's usually not possible when you have a complex team of maybe people who are working together for the first time, maybe people who are new at game development, trying new tools, new engines, new skills, new genres, trying new things, which is what game development is pretty much always about. It's always about learning new skills and problem solving, which is super fun and super exciting. But going so far to make a really big and complex game, it's actually not the most fun most of the time. I would really advise people focus on what we call awesome per second in just making the most cool, the most fun, the most polished game that you can in what little time we have in a really short playtime, that a really, really fun five minute game is almost always infinitely better than a pretty good or okay four hour game. Um, that a really, really short game where you have all of this quality compacted into this experience, that's great because a game jam game, you know, it's not the type of game that people are gonna play for hours. It's a game, type of game that people will play for a few minutes. So really focus on making a fantastic experience for a few minutes. Something that's really fun, really cute, maybe funny, however you want to execute that per your creativity and your vision. But really focus on that awesome per second in that minimum viable product. And as things go along in your game development process, do not be afraid, in fact, really actively, proactively kill your darlings, cut down the scope, make it simple. Just really, really keep it simple. Take the simplest possible version of your game idea and make that as fast as you can. And then if you make that really quickly because you're awesome, which I'm sure you are, then take that extra time and just polish it. Just add juice and feel and pretty colors and sound and music and all those great things, tweening and animation and particle effects and screen shake and whatever other kind of game jam, uh, game feel tips you would like to implement. I'm a big fan of all of that. I'm a big fan of your game feel, huge fan of tweening animations, which can be very easy and fast to implement. It's usually built into most game engines or a simple free plugin where you can add squash and stretch like animation principles just procedurally. And that's, that's really, really great. I would also really caution um, on not implementing sound early enough. Sound and UI are both often afterthoughts in the game development process, in the game jam process especially, and it shouldn't be. Uh, focus on implementing some sound as soon as you can, within you know the first build or two, uh, the first day of, of this Friday. Please try and implement just some rough sounds, even if it's just you like making boop 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 into like just random silly noises into your microphone. That adds so much value, especially if you can do just like a little bit of random pitch variance, which is also a pretty simple thing to do in most game engines. A uh, little bit of pitch variance, a little bit of just silly random sounds, whether that's recorded with your mouth, downloaded from you know, Kenny Assets, or made with uh, BFXR. There are tons of great resources to get great or at least usable sound, effect, sound effects and sound assets quickly, which adds a lot of fun and a lot of value to your game. I would also warn in not making builds often enough or soon enough. 
Try to always keep the game in a playable state. If you're having trouble with that, it's probably a sign that your mechanics are a little too complex for the time frame allotted. So again, cut down on the scope, make the simplest version of your game possible, and yeah, always have a running build every six hours or whatever time interval you prefer where, hey, there's a new playable version, um, regardless of what state it's in. And if you have that, then you can always submit to the jam. Lots of people don't submit something to game jams when they're inexperienced with game development and game jams because they don't make a build fast enough and they try to at the end and it's buggy and it doesn't work and it crashes and it doesn't compile. Uh, avoid those problems by compiling super early. As soon as you just make a blank level with a square or a cube or whatever it is, make some builds. And that can be really fun in making playable snapshots of your game's development as you progress and showing, you know, here's the V001, here's the V002, and you can see how your game evolved over time. That's a lot of fun in itself and guarantees that you can submit something, regardless of if you lose power or internet because it's snowing outside or whatever else is going on. Really, really recommend that. Some quick other tips on making your game a little bit more attractive is colors. Color palette is something people, again, often kind of leave as an afterthought or just haphazardly choose randomly. Go online and find a good color palette. If you're not an artist or don't have an artist, just you can go to a website like uh, coolers.co or some kind of auto-generative or AI-based color palette picking website. And yeah, that can just give you however many colors you need that work together really nicely. And you can just drag and drop or you know, eyedropper those colors in into your game world, your assets. Even if your game is just like simple squares and circles, which is perfectly fine, you can make it really attractive with just like a little bit of good color palettes, a little bit of juice and game feel principles like that screen shake, maybe some chromatic aberrations, some post-processing effects, which are super fun and easy to do in the Unity engine, for example. And that can add a just ton of value. And if you're finding your game is not the most fun during the middle of development, uh, try just speeding it up. Try just increasing the speed of everything across the board. If you have like a really simple top-down shooter, for example, a very common game jam archetype type game, just increasing all of the movement speed can inst by 10% or 20% can instantly make the game way more fun. Really, really recommend that. Also warn not to focus too much on code clarity or code quality and optimization. Premature optimization is the root of all evil after all. And so this is a game jam. It's a really quick and dirty, rough spaghetti code type application. It's not meant to be scalable. It's meant to work as fast as possible. So please just focus on that. Focus on making your core mechanic as fast as possible and then adding that visual polish. How it works under the hood doesn't matter. No one's ever going to care or look at it. And maybe it will actually be kind of cool and kind of funny how hacky things come together at certain points. I know I've certainly enjoyed that in a lot of cases. And in making a playable build of your game frequently, you can have playtesting. Playtesting is the most important part of making a fun game. Of Game design is a lot of artistic principles and scientific principles, but you know, so a lot of times it's more art than science. And getting the human feedback, the human experience of playing your game, putting it in front of people, and seeing how they react, that's invaluable. So I'd really, really recommend that you playtest your game as often as possible. And finally, Game development is a very cooperative and interdisciplinary medium. And so a lot of you are working with teams. You might be forming a team right now. And so keeping good communication with your team is vital. Please check in with your team members all the time, every few hours at least if you're not working together in the same room. Agree to consistent meeting times. Have daily stand-ups or in a game jam format like this, if you're dedicating a whole weekend to it, have a stand up every four or six hours or something like that. Just everybody check in, share what's going on, what problems have you solved, what problems have you encountered, what are your blockers, your obstacles, how can your other team members help you, or how can you agree to cut down that scope and simplify the process so it's something you can achieve together in this allotted window. 
Okay, that will be all from me in terms of advice for this Austin Global Game Jam 2023. However, I have three more people here to give you some game development tips and advice uh, for this event. First off from House of How Games is one of our great senior producers, Dan Bell. I'll let him take it away. Hi everyone, welcome to this year's Game Jam. My name is Dan Bell. I am a senior producer at House of How Games. I've been working in the games industry for over 20 years. I've worked in publishing, I've worked on product teams, everything from the smallest messenger-based games all the way up to big AAA blockbuster multi-billion dollar franchise across multiple genres. I've, I've had a lot of good fortune in my career in the variety of titles I've been able to work on. Because I've seen so many titles, I have been able to see a few things where uh, the common threads running through them all. And I'm going to talk about one of those today. And that is scope control, or feature creep, some might have heard it called. Um, I'm going to talk about feature creep, something called the MVP, and three ways that you can work with your team to try to manage scope. So one of the best ways to help control your scope is through something called the minimum viable project or a minimum viable product, MVP. This is a good version of your game. This is not a great version of your game. This is not even the most spectacular version of your game. This is just a good version of the game. And the, the best way to sort of decide what your MVP is going to be is through your requirement setting. Your requirements, if for those of you familiar with the software development lifecycle, very first phase of product development of where you decide, along with all your stakeholders, what you want to do as your game. In this case, we'll be referencing back to the requirements doc throughout the course of development to make sure that the things we're working on are the things that we're supposed to be working on. It's not enough to build something right. It's important to also build the right thing. So the minimum viable product is the good version of your, pro your project based on the requirements doc. The second part that goes along with an MVP is also to have a good change process, a good process for requesting changes to the design of the MVP. This process needs to be associated, needs to be communicated out to any team that you'll be working with, whether they're a co-dev, whether they're a third party, whether they're an internal dependency team, but all of the teams need to understand what it, what it will take to request a change on your project. So as you can imagine, as a producer, I am used to making plans and remaking plans and remaking plans. Every plan is only good up until the moment that you actually have to execute on the plan. And then it changes. Everything changes. Um, that's just the way planning works. The important part of planning is to make sure that when you have to revise your plan, you're revising it with a minimal amount of risk to the project. And you're making sure that those revisions are being pushed out to everybody that needs to know. This is where that, that change process comes into play. Now, plans usually have three different states. We'll talk about a couple of them. The, one of the more important states is the very beginning state. That's when everybody's brainstorming, pie in the sky. You want to make sure everybody is maintaining their a high level of creativity while they're doing this. So adding a plan to that could squelch that creativity and you don't want to do that. So it's always, I always like letting people continue on with the brainstorming for as long as it takes to create a good requirement stock. After that, 
you can go back to people and say, okay, is this the good, the better, or the best version of that system? And if they say, well, this is the better or the best version of the system, then try to get them to define what good, what a good version of the system looks like so that you can have that as the MVP. Usually a better or best version is a more expensive version time, quality, and resource wise. So if you can figure out what the good version is, then that's what you can help use to build the scaffolding for your MVP. So after you've done that at the beginning and you know what good looks like for every one of those systems, then you can also start having people define, okay, what does better look like? What does a better system look like? What does the best system look like? Let's take a loot system in an RPG, maybe a, a good, adequate version of a loot system is something that gives you a random item with random, random st stats. Well, maybe the better version of that system is it's not a random item anymore. It's something that your particular character can use, and it also has stats that your character can use. Terrific. And maybe the best version of that system is where every item is completely bespoke for your character. The items have their own lore that is built into the fiction of the world or the universe or whatever you may, whatever you may be working in. That might be the best version of the system. Or maybe there's a hybrid that fits in there. But either way, having all three of those as part of your requirement stock is good, and having good is where you want to target first. So the second time frame is where this better and best kind of get, uh, enter into the equation. The second time frame is when you're nearing the end of the project. During that time, you've had a chance to let things sort of settle and some systems have percolated and you get into a phase where a lot of people are saying, wouldn't it be cool if? The wouldn't it be cool if is, is good thinking for a team, but bad for a plan. Uh, it, it can potentially really damage a plan. Let's say you have a melee system and somebody says, wouldn't it be cool if during my, my medieval game I could come back from the future in my car and hit somebody with it and run them over as a superpower? Maybe that's cool for your game, but is that realistic for your game? It requires a lot of retooling in order to get something like that after you've been working with a system where you're using swords and shields and maces and other things like that. Um, adding, adding vehicles to that mix is a pretty big ask at that point in time. But still, you want to take every suggestion with a fair amount of seriousness which leads us to the three groups of questions that I like to ask when people want to change scope. The first is, if you have somebody who owns the vision for the game, sometimes this might be called the product owner, depending on what development methodology you're using, but they're the ones that know what the stakeholders are most likely to want to see in the game. So if, the, if you can get it past the product owner, then you can move on to the next step, which is, okay, what is the risk of doing this? Or conversely, what is the risk of not doing this? In that case, it could be that there is a genre standard feature that isn't part of your MVP. Maybe it came up very suddenly, sort of the way uh, a lot of emergent gameplay hits our industry. The Battle Royale being one of the more recent examples where one day it was nowhere, the next day it was making companies billions and billions of dollars. So now your game is coming out in this blast zone of Battle Royale. Can you afford to ship your game without a Battle Royale mode? Depends on your game. There's a lot of questions on a lot of people that you will need to talk to 
in order to see if this is a valid change. Assuming, of course, the product owner says, sure, we want Battle Royale in our game, or yes, it would be an enhancement to have Battle Royale in our game. So that is the risk analysis phase and the risk analysis question. Is it risky to do it from not just a game level, like how much refactoring is it, is it going to take? Are we going to accumulate any tech debt in other areas if we move resources over to this? What is it going to cost us to, to do this? Then the final question is, after we've decided we can accept the risk and the product owner is okay with it, is, is this something that we have to do now? And this is the one where you really get a big group of people together, particularly the stakeholders, because there are going to be trade-offs that will have to be made in order to add large features that add a lot of risk. And usually that's going to come in the form of either lesser quality or more time or more resources or one, anyone, pick two as they, as they say. And the stakeholders are the ones that are going to be able to validate whether or not it's worth doing it. But also there are many other teams involved. There could be marketing spend that's been, marketing funds that have been expended already on communicating a ship date out to the users. There could be an IP reason. For example, you own the IP, but you only get it for 12 months. If you delay your game by three months, that means you only have nine months now, potentially, of being able to capitalize on that relationship and on that IP in order to generate the revenue. And at that point, you have to wonder if it's worth the cost of the license uh, for only getting nine months worth of revenue instead of 12. So there are a lot of other groups that you have to involve. Is QA slotted to go to another team and you're not going to have QA after a certain date? You have a whole bunch of different ripples that you have to watch out for. Once you have decided what your minimum viable product is and you have a good change process and you go through those three questions and you say, yes, we can take the change, yes, it's worth the risk, and yes, we need it now, you have just increased your scope, but at least when you've increased your scope, you've done it in an intelligent way that has been communicated through to everyone and everyone is still on the same page. I hope that helps folks give a little, have a little more insight into sort of the production planning process of games. It's definitely something that can help you make sure that you complete your game during a small time box like a game jam. And I think that's probably one of the things that's most important about managing your scope is if you don't, you risk, you have a greater risk of not even finishing what you've been working on. Take care and good luck. Thank you so much, Dan, for your really wonderful advice. I also would like to get input from one of our long-standing Austin game development community locals, John Henderson. John has been a mainstay part of the Austin game dev community for a very long time. He's been one of the key organizers for the Austin Global Game Jam for many, many years and has run the Video Game Makers Unite um, and IGDA Austin. He's had his reliable hands in so many different events and community involvement projects throughout the history of game development here in Austin. Uh, he's a really wonderful guy and has some advice for you as well. So please, John. Okay, well, um, here we go. Uh, my name is John Henderson and I don't like talking to myself. I, just, I do it all the time. Usually there's not a recording live and usually I'm on my feet and I'm walking around and Usually if I'm sitting down, there's someone else on the other side of the internet wanting to talk to me. But um, I've been involved with the Global Game Jam in Austin since 2018 when I was working at the Hoft Institute at the Game Design and Development Lab. I got to work with Tyler Coleman and Jay Johns before they were both uh, instructors at UT Austin. 
and Justin Andrews came in the year after that. And so there's a proud and tr uh, tried history of this lar being the largest global game jam in Texas, five years running. You are now part of that tradition. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that I can run my mouth about Austin and game development all the time. So when Gunner asked me to make a video, I didn't exactly jump the chance, but I figured it was a challenge worth taking. You know, I'm, I'm talking to a real person, I'm monologuing like a Spider-Man. So another thing about this is I'm doing this uh, weeks before the actual game jam. And for all I know, I'm standing there among you on site. Or maybe I'm sitting at home like uh, right now, like many of you. Uh, either way, I'll be on Discord and look for the handle Mr. Bananic. I'll be the one telling you you're doing it wrong, except not usually, not really. Uh, and I don't want to go on too long, so I'll just present these three points for you here. And here's hoping I don't screw up the video for that too bad. Point number one, respect the process. Uh, chances are a big chunk of you have never done a game jam before. And I, I can't be more specific because... Uh, there have been so many of these opportunities to jam in recent years, uh, even during the pandemic. Uh, at the best, jam is a is going to have a prototype. You're going to be able to make a prototype for a game, is what I'm trying to say. You don't have time enough to do more than that. And you're going to have to decide on a focus for jam. And the earlier you get to that, the easier it might go. But it is also going to matter what abilities your team members can bring and how well they can communicate with each other. And you'll find that communication... It's a task all by itself, and hopefully you can figure out a way to make that work too. And your team might have a leader, or you might figure out some distributed fight club-like cooperative arrangement. Hopefully you won't spend too much time deciding which technology to use either. But no matter what the top size of your team, every one of you is going to have to wear multiple hats. But the real thing I want to warn you about in this regard is that none of you are going to make the new Skyrim. Okay, just put that out of your minds. Uh, you might make the new Burger Time. Actually, that would be pretty cool if you could make the new bar Burger Time. Uh, but the only way you can screw this up is to give up. And that leads me to point two. Point two is be brave enough to fail gloriously. And even if you are experienced as a game developer or as a game jammer, you deserve to know that everything is stacked against you for finish a game in 48 hours. It's, it's scary. It's, frankly, it's really scary. It's And it's okay to be scared by that. I'm not asking anyone not to be scared right now. A little bit. Shouldn't be terrifying. But it's okay to be a little scared. Because I don't think it's fair to ask anyone to not feel a certain way. I'm instead going to ask you not to let your fear get in the way of what you want. Put it aside. Remind yourself. There's no real danger here. It's just that however you measure success, well, you're probably not going to get that. So you should expect it, but don't fear it. Be brave enough to accept improbable odds and do your best anyway. Final point, keep in touch. And this one, I'm pretty sure no one else will say much about. At least I've never heard anyone talking about it in terms of Global Game Jam. You may meet some people over the weekend you didn't know before. And this is sometimes referred to as making contacts or or more obliquely as networking. Whatever you want to call it, what it's it's another thing worth improving about yourself. And don't miss this opportunity. Even if you didn't meet anyone who can further your own interests, your education, your exposure to new ideas, your career, the contact you did make might be able to lead you to the next contact who could provide any of those things. And if you can make it to the end, you're all going to have the shared experience to remember. Though I imagine by Sunday afternoon, you're probably going to want to shower and maybe a drink. I don't know. Whatever. Um, I'll see you, everyone, in another couple of weeks. Uh, have fun. Do the best you can. Stay in touch. Whatever. Bye. Thank you so much, John. And finally, I have one more John here to give you some advice. John Lutz, who is the CFO and COO of House of How Games, coming from many, many years experience with EA. He's graciously given some of his time to share some of his wisdom from his decades of experience in the game development industry. Thank you, John. Hi everyone, my name's uh, John Lutz and I am the CFO and COO for House of How Games. I'm honored to uh, join you today at the uh, Austin Global Game Jam and uh, 
I was asked to give a few words of wisdom about your careers and how you think about embarking on hopefully a long and successful journey into the video game industry uh, that may begin right here at the Global Game Jam. So I was with Electronic Arts for 24 years in a variety of roles spanning the publishing group, the corporate teams, um, and spent most of my time uh, working in the studio organizations. Uh, I was CFO for EA Sports. I was the CFO for all of EA's global game studios at one point. Um, and I worked with the executive team of the company uh, to help um, put the strategies together uh, for EA to grow and develop um, and to help us make decisions around how we allocate money and invest money across all of the different studios um, and opportunities um, that are presented to, to EA. So what did I learn at EA and what advice can I impart onto you um, as you embark on your careers? Um, well, I'm going to cover three things briefly with you today, and hopefully you'll take something away from this, and it will be of some use to you at some point in the future. Uh, so the first thing I would say is always show up as your authentic self. So make sure that you choose an employer where you feel that you can be yourself every day when you go to work and you can turn up with your own ideas. You can feel comfortable promoting those ideas um, and you can defend those ideas in a genuine way and in a collaborative way uh, by being yourself. Uh, I've seen too many examples where people have this Jekyll and Hyde personality and they feel like they need to show up for work as a different person to who they are in real life. And what I've <coughs> noticed in my career is the folks that are most successful tend to be those uh, that have no barrier between um, their personal life and their work life and they are the same person um, regardless of how they're interacting. The second thing I'd bring up and this one may be obvious but um, is to learn how to work effectively with other people. Um, <clears throat> so the video game business has become extremely complex much like think about building a car there's no one individual anymore that could build a car from end to end, right? Uh, you need to mine the materials. You need to forge the steel. Uh, you need to create the computer chips that are go gonna go in the car. You need to build the engine. Um, you need to assemble the car. You need to, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people are involved in the production of every car. Um, and in video games, the same kind of things happen, right? Um, where the roles have become so specialized um, and making games such a massive undertaking and so complex um, that no one person can make an entire game. So you are going to have to work with lots of other people um, with lots of other different skills complementary uh, to your own. Um, so learning to work effectively in a team, um, to play your role, to communicate well with others is, is critical. And in games in particular, where we're combining creative talent and technical talent, we have lots of different characters, lots of different personalities, lots of different ways about thinking about problems and being able to sort of navigate through that in a way that's collaborative and working effectively with, with, with those around you will take you a long way in our industry. So be a team player. The last piece of advice or words of wisdom I might impart as you think about your career in games is try and treat every decision that you make or every decision that you're asked to make or that your team is making, try and have an opinion and think about it as if it was your own company, as if it was your own money or your own time or your own resources that were on the line uh, for every decision that needs to get made so that you show up with a genuine point of view on what the decision should be. In other words, put yourself in the shoes of the leader, of the, the executive producer that's running the game or of the studio general manager that's got to make this call. And what would you do? And that's a, sometimes a really tough question to ask yourself. And you know, sometimes it's not obvious, but you have to make a choice. Are you gonna go for door A or door B? So think about that. Um, and by doing so, I think you force yourself again Coming back to my first point about showing up as your authentic self, you, for, you force yourself to have an opinion and then to present it as yourself. And you may not have all of the facts and metrics and figures to, to back it up. Uh, some of it may be gut. 
gut feel based on experience or things that have happened in, in prior games that you've worked on. And that's okay too. All of that is, is valuable input into uh, the decision-making process. So that's all I had to share with you today. Uh, hopefully that has been of some interest. Um, I'm having an absolute blast here at House of How as the CFO, COO for the studio. Uh, been here for about a year now and um, loving being part of a small but growing entrepreneurial studio that really embraces the idea of showing up as yourself, treating decisions as if they were your own and learning how to work effectively with other folks. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Sean. And again, thank all of you for joining in this Austin Global Game Gym 2023 event. Despite the winter storms, come hell or high water, come uh, rain or snow, we really appreciate you trying to make games with us. Uh, please have a great time jamming. Ask around in the Austin Global Game Gym Discord if you need help with anything and have fun.